Oh, I can't hear you. Unmute yourself. You're muted. Recording's in progress? Yes, we're recording. I'll edit this part out. Okay, that's a good idea. I mean, unless you make like a really good joke or something. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of unlikely right now. <laughs> Groovy. All right, everybody. Well, welcome to our presentation of tonight's uh, webinar, South Bay Origins. Um, for those of you who maybe are not familiar with uh, the three of us here on the side, uh, my name is Erin. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator with the Hermosa Beach Historical Society. Um, and with me, we have Jamie, our Director and Curator, and Mark, who is uh, on our Board of Directors, and he's also going to be running this um, webinar because he's the one that did all of this wonderful research and put together the slideshow we're about to do. Um, so we wanted just to kind of start off with um, just informational polls from our audience um, just to see who we're working with since it's in a webinar atmosphere. And um, if you haven't done one of these before on Zoom, um, that just means that basically we have you like off camera and, and muted. So it's not the same as having a meeting. Um, and we do want to hear from you, but it's just easier to make sure that everyone's muted at the same time. And no, no background noise pops up. So um, let's see if I can go ahead and put this up. Did we, uh, this first poll, <clears throat> let's see if it will work. So this first poll is, everyone can see that, I hope, um, is where are you joining us from today? So you can go ahead and click your answer. Um, I don't see turkey as an option. I know I had to put just <laughs> outside. I should have put turkey on there. That would have been funny. Um, so if Very you're from specific. Hermosa specifically or the South Bay, which, you know, that's a, a, a loose uh, definition of where you're at. But um, outside of um, the South Bay, it would be like more like actually L.A., uh, the city of L.A. Or, or San Diego, Orange County, that kind of thing. Um, all right. So we have... I think everyone except for myself has answered. Um, so it looks like most of us are from um, Hermosa, which is awesome, South Bay area. Um, and I would like to know where outside of the South Bay you're from, if you want to throw that in the chat. You got three people that are from outside of LA, one person from LA County, um, but not South Bay. Uh, so that is the end of that poll. And then just to gauge... I guess I can share the results. Um, just to gauge um, your knowledge on the subject. Let's see if I can close this. What? Poll two. Okay, so you know what? I actually took that down because we talked about this today, didn't we, Mark? This is going to be a poll at the end. Excuse me. Uh, so that's going to be our poll for today. Um, so with all, <laughs> with all that said, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Mark for our presentation. Um, <clears throat> do you want to explain, you know, your, your, um, the question, your situation with questions or. We're taking say? questions at the end. So hold Perfect. on to them. And Aaron and I are going to help field them in the chat. So have them ready to go for Mark and we will answer as many as we can at the end with respect to everybody's time. Um, if there are any questions that we don't get to, you can always send us an email and I will make sure to leave our email in the chat before we depart. Sounds awesome. All right. It's all you, Mark. Okay. So I'm still seeing the poll screen. So I guess I can close that. I'm going to minimize you. So I take it. Everybody can see this title page. Um, my name is Mark Shoemaker. I've been a board member with the Hermosa Beach Historical Society since 2005. And um, I grew up in El Segundo, and um, I was kind of interested in just understanding, you know, what was it like before, you know, was kind of habitated by, uh, by Americans coming in from other places. And the area we're going to talk about today is going to be the South Bay, which is down here where the horse riders are, Salsa Redondo. A little bit of San Pedro, Rancho San Pedro, the, the San Pedro area, and uh, up here, Aguaja de la Centinela, which is kind of where Inglewood is now, and La Bayona, which is here's where Marina del Rey is and Playa del Rey. So then you'd have the airport, El Segundo, Her, um, Manhattan, Hermosa, Redondo. 
So mainly it's going to be about this portion of Los Angeles. Okay, and I call it Harbors, Railroads, and Real Estate because as I did my research, I kind of realized that it was, you know, the harbors that kind of drove the, the development of the area and the railroads joining the harbors. And, um, and then that led to the, the city developments, the real estate sales. So I'm trying to go page down here. I'm not, oh, there it is. Okay, first we're gonna um, talk a little bit about the early environment of the South Bay, what it looked like um, a long time ago. So you had, you had um, a watershed and you had two watersheds in LA. You had the Bayona Creek watershed, uh, which came down from the mountains. And this was the historical watershed for the Los Angeles basin. And one of the main tributaries was Sentinella Creek, which is up by where Inglewood is. There was Sentinella Springs. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then this flowed down into uh, the Bayona Lagoon, which is where Marina Del Rey is now and Play Del Rey and the wetlands out there. And then you had another uh, watershed. It's our modern watershed. And that's the Los Angeles River coming down for the mountains, exiting down at uh, what's Los Angeles Harbor now. So this is what the Bayona Creek watershed looked like from 1850, 1890, which is about when um, a lot of this presentation covers is the late 1800s. So Bayona Creek was the main watershed in the late 1800s. And again, this is Marina Del Rey, the Playa Del Rey wetlands down in this area, Sentinella Creek coming down from Englewood, and some other kind of wet areas that fed into this watershed. So you can see from down here, this was kind of a brackish marsh. These were um, meadows um, and um, freshwater marshes up in this area and then they float on down into the Santa Monica Bay. The Los Angeles River watershed is 51 miles long and it's fed by all these streams and creeks and rivers uh, from the, the mountains uh, coming across the foothills and joining the Los Angeles River and flowing into the basin and exiting down at San Pedro, Wilmington area. These were the kind of the wet areas and the, and the type of uh, flora and, and that was, was in these wet areas. Um, you had salt marshes here. Again, this is kind of the, um, this is kind of the Bayona Creek area here. So it was salt marsh and um, meadows. And then this is kind of where the Los Angeles River is flowing down through this wet area. And down in here was all salt marsh, down where the Los Angeles Harbor is. So when we look at the South Bay, we're looking at this area down through here. And all this area was uh, coastal dune and bluff scrub. So there was a lot of like dune flowers, dune plants that, that grew up along here. And then further inland, uh, east of the dunes, you had grasslands and flower fields all through this area. In fact, this area down here became a source for the, the first flower markets in Los Angeles. They would come out here and collect wildflowers and take them to the markets in Los Angeles. <laughs> And then here where it's got Inglewood coming down through here is a coastal sage scrub. So that was the main plants that were growing um, in the area or the main, that was the main kind of terrain. Some of the, some of the main flora were cypress trees, juniper, uh, juniper bushes and wildflowers and Ranging all around in this area of the Los Angeles Basin, we had bear, wolf, uh, cougar, coyote, raccoons, rabbits, squirrels. So there's a lot of mammals living out in this area. 
Now we'll get more into the historical background. So in um, 1493, the Spanish first came to the New World. And it wasn't until 1769, so you know, 270 years later, that the Spanish decided to do the Portola expedition led by Portola. And he went up into Alta California from Mexico. And in fact, part of his expedition north, um, he actually stayed out here at the um, Biona wetlands because that's where the water was. He would have been camping and he stayed down there. In 1781, Los Angeles was founded. And in 1784, the Spanish crown granted their first rancho, this Rancho San Pedro, huge piece of property to uh, Juan Jose Dominguez. You know, hence you have Dominguez University, Dominguez Hills. He was a soldier. And this area included Redondo, Torrance, Carson, Compton, San Pedro and Wilmington. You know, at the same time that the Spanish came into this area, you had about what's estimated to maybe be about three to 500 indigenous Tongva, Tongva Chumash Indians living in this area. And a lot of them were living up in Bayona, again, because this was the wetlands area. This is where they would get water and, and probably, you know, there's good hunting there, good planting. Um, but when, they, when the Spanish came in, that three to 500 population of indigenous were decimated from disease and and, and incarcerations at some of the missions that the Spanish set up. So unfortunately the Indians or the indigenous didn't really um, play a big role in the development of the South Bay. And there's very little history uh, left of them except for some artifacts. Um, so then later on in 1821, um, after a decade of conflict, Mexico gained their uh, independence from the Spanish Empire. Yeah, so from, there you go, from 1493 to 1821, we were all part of the, uh, this land was all part of the Spanish Empire. So Mexico gets their independence. Um, and in 1837, the governor of Alta California, he grants uh, Rancho Salsa Redondo, which is here's the airport, El Segundo, Hermosa, Manhattan, Hermosa, not Redondo, not Redondo Beach, but this area here is, uh, is called Salsa Redondo. And um, that was granted 22,458 acres to, to a man named Antonio Ignacio Avila. And then in 1837, they granted, the, uh, Mexico granted this Rancho Aguaje de la Sentinela to Ignacio Machado. And one of the Hermosa Beach board members is actually related to this, this uh, Ignacio Machado. And this is kind of where you have uh, Inglewood and Westchester up in this area. And then in 1839, uh, Rancho La Bayona was also uh, granted to the Machado family and the Talamantes family. And this is where you have Marina Del Rey, uh, Mar Vista, Palms, West Side Village, Mar Vista. Then in 1849, we have the California Gold Rush. So that starts bringing in a lot of people into California. And then in 1850, the Mexican-American War ends. California becomes a state. And now, instead of these ranchos being just, you know, places where the owners could raise cattle and have kind of a tranquil lifestyle, they're starting to pay taxes. And that creates a whole set of circumstances to start breaking up these ranchos. Because prior to that, they didn't have to worry about paid taxes. Now they actually have to pay to keep their land. So this is a, this is a, a, a little section on a man named Phineas Banning, who uh, came to California as a young man in his 20s. And he settled down near San Pedro. Uh, these, these pictures are from a US Coast Survey that was done. Actually, Congress did their first uh, Coast Survey of the United States in the early 1850s. And um, they mapped the whole coastline of the US. So these vignettes came out of this, uh, 
out of the Coast Survey that was done by the US Congress, it was funded by the US Congress. Um, so this is, what, this is what Los Angeles, San Pedro would have looked like um, in 1853. Um, you just had the Pueblo de Los Angeles up here. You can see the Los Angeles River kind of coming down this way. And um, down in here was San Pedro and Point Vincente, where we have the Point Vincente Lighthouse. And then again, this is all your South Bay up through here. And this is what it would have looked like from a ship offshore. This is Palos Verdes here. This was called uh, Dead Man's Island. And this is a couple little ships in there, probably uh, anchored to move some cattle, uh, hides and beef um, onto the boats from Los Angeles area here. So he came here in 1851, a 21-year-old man, young man from Wilmington, Delaware. So Wilmington's a familiar name for good reason. Um, he starts a stagecoach line from San Pedro via uh, Los Angeles to Salt Lake City, Utah, and Yuma, Arizona. And then in 1858, he buys land from Manuel Dominguez of the, of the Rancho San Pedro, and he's to build a new harbor. He's going to call it New San Pedro. And then in 1861, the Civil War begins, and um, he's concerned about this harbor that he started down in Los Angeles because he's getting this pro-Confederacy uh, sentiment and decides to donate land to the Union Army for Camp Drum Barracks, which is still a historical site there down in the uh, Wilmington area. This is what Camp Drum Barracks looked like from 1861 to 1871. Um, they actually had camels uh, at Camp Drum Barracks because um, camels were brought out west as an experiment to see how they would do for the army. And um, those camels ended up residing down at, uh, at Drum Barracks. They were brought down from Fort Tejon, where, um, up by Gorman on the five, there's Fort Tejon. Then in uh, 1863, the harbor's renamed Wilmington. I'm sure it was because of where he was from, Wilmington, Delaware. The Civil War ends. Um, and in 1868, he organized the construction of Southern California's first railroad, the Los Angeles and San Pedro, to run freight to and from his harbor in, in San Pedro. He dredged the channel in 1870 and built a wharf for ship unloading. And in 1873, uh, the Southern Pacific Railroad which had completed the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, bought his railroad, and they created a monopoly on the port of Los Angeles until 1888. We'll talk about that later. But this is what Wilmington Harbor would have would looked like back in um, 1870. These pictures were colorized. I think they look a lot better in color. And you can see his little locomotive here, the San Gabriel. And there's the San Gabriel going out onto a tracks out into the harbor. And this is mud. This is what it would have been like to unload those ships uh, before he built this wharf. You would have had your ship out here. You would have to bring in a small boat, unload onto a mud flat and load onto a mud flat. This is an 1877 bird's eye view of Wilmington. So here you can see the, the railroad tracks coming out onto his wharf here, going out, here's Los Angeles in the distance. And this is the booming town of Wilmington in 1877 in San Pedro Bay, not much going on. Here's another picture of the harbor area. This is rail tracks going out onto the wharves. These are old, I guess, uh, sailing ships. There's that dead man's island still out there. It's gone now. Then another, another important figure in, this, in the development of the South Bay is Daniel Freeman. And um, he's really kind of the guy that we could say is the, you know, the father of the South Bay. So there was this little rancho here called Aguaja de Sentinella. And it refers to a spring that's on, on this land here. And you can still go up to Inglewood 
and see a, a marker where this spring once flowed and flowed down into uh, Biona Creek. And in 1860, uh, a, Scotman, a Scottish nobleman named Sir Robert Bennett, um, he bought this little rancho, 2,219 acres, which is where Inglewood is now. And he started raising sheep, not cattle. Pre previously, most of this land was, was raising cattle, but he decided to raise sheep. And then later on, he buys all of Salsa Redondo, and uh, he now owns 25,000 acres of land here. This is also Redondo and Aguaje de Sentinella. Um, in 1872, Daniel Freeman came out to California, to Southern California, to the South Bay from Canada uh, with his wife, Catherine, and three children. She had a dowry, and he was actually a debtor fleeing uh, legal action when he came down to the South Bay. So in 1873, Catherine, not Daniel, uh, entered into a lease agreement with, Bar with Burnett, the Scotman, Scottishman, and uh, with the intent to eventually purchase the ranchos from Burnett. And uh, they purchased about 10,000 sheep to raise. But a year later, Catherine died from tuberculosis um, and then in uh, 1875, the Sentinella Land Company is formed to sublease land to settle. So Daniel Freeman had his, his eyes on development, uh, but the venture failed. Um, his, sheep, his sheep stock grew to 26,000, but uh, in 1875, a drought forced him to sell all his sheep. So he's a big land owner, he's a big land least lessor, but um, He's not really doing real well on the, on the development side yet. This is what uh, Los Angeles and the South, and what the South Bay looked like from Los Angeles in um, 1877. You have Los Angeles down here. You're looking south. Um, this is Palos Verdes. Wilmington's down here. And our South Bay is over here. So pretty wide open territory still in 1877. Um, so after his, after his sheep venture failed and his subleasing failed, um, in 1876, Daniel Freeman established an, or, an orchard um, and he started planting uh, wheat and barley. And by the, in the 1880s, that became a very profitable business for him. He was selling a million bushes, bushels of grain annually from, from his land holdings, much of it to the US military. And then he started subleasing land in, in his property to hundreds of settlers. And then in 1886, he finally purchases from Burnett both ranchos. And so now he's the single owner of 25,000 acres of land. And this is when his development activity really starts taking off in a couple directions. This is that spring I was talking about earlier, the Sentinella Spring. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like this anymore, but um, that was the source of water for that rancho and, and that water flowed down Sentinella Creek into Biona Creek and out into the ocean. Um, this is kind of a, a little more history on Daniel Freeman's life. This is the rancho that he lived in which is still standing. It's the uh, La Casa Sentinella Adobe and it's still standing in Inglewood. Um, and later on when he, his developments took off, he built this mansion in Inglewood called the Freeman Mansion. Unfortunately, that got torn down, um, I think to make room for part of the Daniel Freeman Hospital. But he became a very important person in Los Angeles. He was the president of the Chamber of Commerce and he died a wealthy man. But we'll, we'll back up and talk about his developments now. So before I go much further, I wanted to just put this little bit of history in that there was a, a real estate boom in Los Angeles and railroads were competing for a harbor. Um, so the Transcontinental Railroad got established in 1869. Uh, that was the first Transcontinental Railroad 
to Los Angeles. And um, from 1873 to 1877, LA and the nation suffered a severe recession during the started during the panic of 1873. So prior to, prior to 1873, a lot of banks were funding railroad development throughout the, throughout the nation, but um, this kind of speculative boom ended in 1873, the banks divested from railroads. So the country was kind of in a recession for a while, sounds familiar. And um, later on in 1886 then, uh, the second transcontinental railroad was completed by the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. And at that time, there wasn't a designated harbor, you know, that Congress was funding, that the nation was funding. So LA needed a harbor, and there, you now had two railroads that were coming out to Los Angeles, and they were offering really low uh, rates to entice people to move to California. And in 1887, there was a speculative real estate boom throughout LA County, all these Land developers were promising towns were going to be developed, and a lot of land was sold. A lot of land prices went way up and stayed up. Um, population increased. So you can see here that uh, on this chart down here at the bottom, the population of the LA County, that big area that we saw earlier, that big wide open area in, in the city of Los Angeles, was only about um, 30, 33,000 people in 1880. But during that boom period of the of the late 1880s, the population tripled to over 100,000. Um, so this is again another picture of what uh, Los Angeles looking to, of Los Angeles looking down onto Palos Verdes here. More development than 1877 view, but this is still pretty wide open country out here. So then, then the, uh, the first harbor venture was Port Bayona for Atchison, Topeka. So here again, you know, we we'll go back to when 1886, this is when Daniel Freeman was able to purchase his 25,000 acres of, uh, ranch, of the ranchos. And his first venture was with a group of investors um, to build the Port Bayona Harbor, which is where Marina Del Rey is now but they need to dredge this area. This is what it looked like before dredging. Um, this was the vision of this harbor. <clears throat> so you have this land up here, which is basically Playa del Rey now. And this ran that was Rancho Salsa Redondo. Then you had Rancho Bayona, which is where Marina del Rey is. This was kind of the artist's view of what, what the, uh, the new port of Los Angeles was gonna look like. And um, of course, Daniel Freeman was excited because all this land up here was gonna be sold and he was gonna make a lot of money selling land that was close to this port. And it needed a railroad. You can see a little railroad down here. So this was a very uh, you know optimistic port idea. A lot of advertising in the uh, newspapers promoting Port Bayona, beautiful Lake Bayona, you know, lovely country place. It was really being heavily promoted, you know, to sell real estate with the idea that this would become the Port of Los Angeles. This is an 1886 view. You can see that um, a rail, this is the Southern Pacific Railway coming here, and then a railway was built coming down here through what's today's wetlands out to the harbor. And so that rail line um, became owned by uh, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. The, uh, I can't see the very top of my screen. Is there a way you can change that, um, Jamie or Aaron? Anyway, I can't read that first line, but this is an 1888 view of, of the rail line going out to the Port Bayona Harbor. And at that time, the it was kind of a lagoon down here. There's still a little bit of a lagoon left over there in Playa del Rey, this portion down here, but that was kind of a long lagoon. And this is where the water came out and flowed out into the ocean. So this was the, uh, in 1889, they started dredging that area the lagoon area to make the harbor 
Um, and it was the largest dredge in the USA, aptly named La Bayona. And um, it just it just didn't get anywhere. There, there was tide issues. And um, so the project was eventually abandoned in 1892. Um, they just couldn't get the they couldn't get the harbor dredged out. They couldn't get the lagoon dredged to create the harbor. And then in 1892, the the um, the whole railway that was going down into that area, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe railway, was abandoned. So to hedge their bets, I think <clears throat> Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe also uh, had their eyes on Redondo Beach as the port of Los Angeles. And so um, in 1887, again, you know, about a year after uh, Daniel Freeman obtained ownership of all this property, he, he uh, worked with some investors and they developed the Sentinel Inglewood Land Company. And they, that land company purchased 11,000 acres of the um, Sentinel Rancho and the, and the Salsa Redondo Rancho. And then, in, and then another company was developed called Redondo Beach Company. And they purchased 1,400 acres of uh, oceanfront, which was to become Redondo Beach. So Redondo was part of Rancho San Pedro. And the idea was that they were going to run this, uh, <clears throat> they were going to build a wharf here for the second port of Los Angeles in Redondo. And Santa Fe uh, built another railway line that came out of Inglewood, dropped down to basically what's uh, aviation now. This is about the corner of um, Rosecrans and Sepulveda. And uh, then comes across here where the green belt is now and comes on down, the Atchison Topeka comes on down through this area to Redondo Beach, to, the, to a wharf. So this is a view of Redondo Beach being promoted at that time. And they had this, uh, they said they were gonna build this big hotel there and this area is gonna be developed. Um, this is the Redondo Beach area platted um, with the wharfs here that were gonna be, this was gonna be the port of Los Angeles and the rail line coming down through here to feed these, uh, to take to take freight off of these wharves and bring freight onto the wharves. At that time, we still had of note here a little. Um, this on this map is called looks like called Las Salinas. This was a salt lagoon, and this is where uh, salt manufacturing was done. I have a little picture of that later on. So this is a better close-up view of that area. It was going to be a. It's going to be the port. It was going to be a tourist destination. Um, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe really thought this was a a, a great idea. Um, it never really took off as much as San Pedro. It only carried about a, a fifth of the volume of freight that San Pedro was was doing over there, where Phineas Banning had his operation going on. That was and that was a Southern Pacific port over there in San Pedro. This was an Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe port, basically. So this is uh, looking at the 1889, looking at the hotel being developed. Um, this would be, you know, what we call the Esplanade now. And this is where King Harbor is. This is King Harbor. This is in 1890, the hotel opens. If you've ever been down to Hotel Dell, it, it's very similar to Hotel Dell. These stairs leading down to the beach are about the only remnant of what was developed back in the late 1880s and for the Hotel of Redondo. These stairs are still there leading down off the Esplanade to the beach in Redondo. There's a color view. There's the Hotel Redondo, the trail tracks going out onto the harbor, onto the wharf undeveloped Palos Verdes in the background. Um, and then uh, more rail lines were developed 
So you had the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe coming in this way, and then the Los Angeles Redondo Railway Company was developed. And these were electric lines that came down into the, um, the harbor area, the Redondo Beach Harbor area. And there was more wharves being built as time went on to handle more freight. It's kind of a, a nice view of the some of the later ships. You're starting to see some steamers coming in here now, along with the sailing ships that would have come into Redondo. There's another view of Redondo Beach and the wharf. Uh, this is taken from the picture would have been taken from the Redondo Hotel. Pretty sparse population at Redondo Beach Harbor. That's an early view looking from the wharf back to Redondo Beach. Again, these are the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railway. Um, and uh, men moving the freight. Another view of early Redondo. Another view of the wharf. I found this picture, I thought it was kind of interesting, a little kid on the beach. Would have been nice to grow up in that area, I guess, at that time, feed the birds. So I had mentioned earlier about the um, Las Salinas, which was this lagoon here, which is where the power plant is now. If you know about our power plant controversy, what are we gonna do with the power plant in Redondo? This is that area. So there was actually a salt works here. Um, prior to the salt works being developed, the, the indigenous people would have used uh, this lagoon to gather salt. Uh, they would put sticks in around the shoreline. The sticks would uh, draw water and the salt water that was drawn up on the sticks sticking in the ground, uh, the salt would crystallize on those sticks and then they could knock it off and they would trade salt um, and shells and other things inland with the uh, Indians that lived inland all the way out to the Colorado River. So if you know where, um, how kind of how aviation kind of branches off from Artesia and kind of winds its way down to PCH and that was that Artesia or that aviation highway or aviation boulevard um, coming down to Hermosa was the route that the Indians would have used, the indigenous would have used to come down to the Salt Lake. So you're so this area out here, looking at where Hermosa is now, and this would have been kind of where aviation winds its way down to the Salt Lagoon. Um, by 1909, uh, there was a bathhouse in Redondo Beach. It was the largest in the world. It had three heated salt water pools. Uh, it was a kind of a, a tourist area for Los Angeles with the railroads bringing people down there. Um, not much population in, in, in Inglewood or Redondo at the time. 1888, only 300 people in Inglewood. And by 1920, there were only 3,300. 3, Redondo didn't grow real fast. 603 people in 1890, uh, eight, 855 in 1900. And then it started picking up with the completion of the railroad, the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe and more development of the wharf area, but still not real big population areas. So, with this second port now open in Redondo, uh, the Southern Pacific, who had their uh, monopoly on the San Pedro Harbor, there was, a, there was a controversy about the control that they had over the San Pedro Harbor. And so they decided to hedge their bet. And they uh, also built another port of Los Angeles, kind of the third port of Los Angeles up in Santa Monica. And it was called the Long Wharf. So this is a view of Santa Monica in 1877, um, about um, 20 years before they started the idea of building a long wharf. This was the Santa Monica Pier, and um, there, was, there was a rail line coming out to the Santa Monica Pier, but Southern Pacific decided to build 
a long wharf up in this area of Santa Monica Bay. So uh, in 1992, they, uh, they, the Southern Pacific started this development um, because they were worried about losing their monopoly on San Pedro. And they built this wharf that was 4,700 feet long. It was called a mile long wharf. Um, it got completed in 1894. It's up around where Temescal Canyon is. And here you can see another view of it. This is the end of the wharf out here, going on into Temescal Canyon. And then Southern Pacific had their rail line going up. If you're familiar with where the California incline is, that little uh, spur that will take you up from Pacific Coast Highway up to Ocean Park, up in uh, the bluffs of Santa Monica. You're looking north here up towards Malibu, and this is where the Long Wharf is or was. So they had their Southern Pacific had their monopoly on the Long Wharf up here, and they had their monopoly on their, uh, or they had their rail lines down here in San Pedro. This is where they had their monopoly, and this is where they built the Long Wharf. And here's your Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe line coming down to Redondo. So the, the monopolies and the, 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 the Southern Pacific monopoly ended. Um, there was a big Free Harbor Jubilee in 1899 um, that this harbor in San Pedro was now going to be the port of Los Angeles. And um, San Pedro Breakwater was started in 1899. And the city of Los Angeles out here, they annexed uh, Wilmington, Wilmington and San Pedro to Los Angeles. So I'm not sure if you've ever heard of a thing called the shoestring, but basically from Los Angeles down to here, Los Angeles annexed and bought land and created this shoestring of property that they owned to, to connect with the, uh, the new port, the newly designated port of Los Angeles that was now gonna get congressional funding and in 1913, that Long Wharf in Santa Monica ended service as a cargo and passenger port. So, so now you've got um, San Pedro as the designated port of Los Angeles. You still have Redondo Beach that has some freight activity going on with the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. Um, and you still have a lot of open land in Rancho Salsa Redondo that needs to be developed. And one of the earlier develop, early developments was a place called Potencia, which means power in Spanish. It also was referred to as Shore Acres and later as we know it as Manhattan Beach. This is kind of what it would have looked like the sand dunes in Manhattan Beach back in the late 1800s. And in 1896, a guy named Parvin Wright he decides to build a 350 foot long wooden pier in Manhattan Beach and puts a wave motor at the end of the pier to create electricity. And the Redondo Land Company started selling property around this uh, wave motor pier idea. Um, in 1897, he had his first public test. Spectators arrived on Santa Fe trains. Um, people were excited. Real estate people were excited. They wanted to sell land. And this wave motor actually supplied X electricity for strand lighting. So it was, it was, it, it did create electricity. This was a little generating uh, station here. But unfortunately, in 1899, a, a storm destroyed the wave motor and, and part of the pier. So that was Manhattan Beach's first pier. And that kind of led to the early land sales around the Manhattan Beach area. Um, here's some early advertising for Manhattan Beach. Um, George Peck uh, bought the north end of Manhattan Beach and called it Shore Acres. And eventually they, Merrill and, and Peck flipped a coin and the Santa Fe station was renamed Manhattan Beach. So the Santa Fe station would have been um, 
up Manhattan Beach Boulevard, kind of where next to where Vons is right now, they're at the green belt. And then um, about that same time, early 1900s, Playa del Rey uh, was looked at as a development area and an electric railway was planned to uh, connect um, Los Angeles with Salsa Redondo. So in 1901, Henry Huntington, his uncle Clovis Huntington was one of the big four that did this uh, transcontinental railroad. Um, this Henry Huntington, he buys a sh the majority share of the Los Angeles and, and uh, Redondo Railway Company. And he opens up an electric line down uh, Hawthorne Boulevard. And, uh, and then in 1905, he purchases from Ainsworth and Thompson, who were the original developers of Redondo. Um, he purchased 90% of the town site and all of the stock of the Los Angeles and Railroad Company. So what we kind of think of as the red cars or the Pacific Electric Railway, that was really uh, Huntington, Henry Huntington consolidating rail line, electric rail lines that were already in existence. So now Henry Huntington owns all of Redondo uh, the railways, wharves, waterfront, everything, about three fourths of the city of Redondo is owned by Henry Huntington, everything except the Hotel Redondo. And in 1902, they decided to bring an electric railway down the coast. Uh, it was going to service a new resort development named Play del Rey, back where the Port Bayona was attempted. Um, and in 1904, the electric line from Playa del Rey to Redondo Beach was inaugurated. So it came down along the coast from uh, Playa del Rey through the dunes, along the beach, um, and uh, through the open lands of, of uh, where El Segundo is, Hermosa, Manhattan, and then Hermosa. This is, these are early views of what Playa del Rey looked like. Um, this is 1902, looking north, um, there was some wooden boardwalks. The lagoon was still there. This is another view looking kind of northeast. Uh, this was basically up here is basically where Marina del Rey is now. I like the way the colors came out in this one. This is this is a uh, early Playa del Rey, the lagoon. This is Santa Monica Pier and Santa Monica up here. They actually had an electric railway line that came down uh, called the Lagoon Line. And then the, um, the Los Angeles Playa del Rey Railroad had their rail line coming down through here. This is all what Marina del Rey used to look like back up in here. So here you can see um, the rail line going down below the bluffs, heading down towards uh, the South Bay. This is how Playa del Rey was promoted uh, by the Beach Land Company. Got the big lagoon here. There's some other newspaper views of, uh, of what Playa del Rey was being promoted as the new city of pleasure, its lagoon and glittering breakers, the beach of the king, Playa del Rey, beach of the king, Marina del Rey, Marina of the king. Um, so now you have this electric railway system that Henry, 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 that Henry Huntington consolidated. And here's our line coming down here to Playa del Rey, down to Redondo. It actually went south of Redondo to a place called Clifton by the Sea, where Henry Huntington built one of his houses. Here's the green belt going back up over to Inglewood. And then, and then Hermosa was, when the electric railway was developed, Redondo was down next to it. Hermosa started being developed as part of Rancho Salsa Redondo. Here's kind of what Hermosa would have looked like with its dunes back in the day. Um, 
1900, the Hermosa Beach Land and Water Company acquired 1500 acres of Rancho Salsa Redondo. They did their first survey in 1901. Um, the Santa Fe, the, the Pier Avenue and Hermosa Avenue was developed um, and Santa Fe station had their, Santa Fe had a station on the, where the green belt is and where Pier and um, the green belt is, was a Santa Fe station. Um, there was a boardwalk on the strand plan and lots were being sold in 1901. This man, uh, Bernard Hiss, was the contractor to build the boardwalks in Hermosa. Uh, he, had, he was a teamster, which meant he had a bunch of mules and graders that he could pull by the mules to level some of the sand dunes and build the boardwalks. And in 1906, uh, Hermosa had their first election for city officers and Ben Hiss, as he was known, he was elected as the first mayor. So the guy that first put in the boardwalks and leveled some of the dunes, he became the first mayor, and in 1907, Hermosa Beach was incorporated. Um, this is a kind of a side note. One of the things that helped uh, real estate promoters sell property in, in the South Bay was that they could promote Hermosa as a sanitary beach, because unfortunately, the city of Los Angeles uh, ran their sewer line out to where the Hyperion is now. And the current carried that raw sewage north to the Venice area, which was also a big development area in Santa Monica. And they were always fighting with the city of Los Angeles to do something about the sewage. But here, because of the currents, and at least the, the summer currents carried that water north. So you had sanitary beaches in Hermosa. They were promoted as sanitary. Uh, this is a 1904 view um, of the Hermosa looking from the pier, a wooden pier that was constructed in uh, 1904, 500 feet long. So there's these maps called Sanborn maps. They're insurance maps. Um, and they would uh, go to areas and, and uh, map out and, and put the major structures and homes on these maps. So this is, this is a picture from the Sanborn map of the Hermosa Beach Public School um, that was built by bonds that were uh, raised in 1904. Um, it was located up at 18th and Monterey. And they actually had to carry the, there was no streets leading up to the school. They actually had to carry the equipment through the dunes This is a view of a, a brick, a sandstone brick company in, uh, I think it was 1904, uh, that made bricks for properties and, and development down in Hermosa. This was a little cottage that was uh, built in Hermosa in 1905 by service workers to have their own little vacation cottage down in Hermosa. Here's this bigger Sanborn map view of some of the main structures that were in Hermosa. So Santa Fe Avenue here uh, is Pier Avenue. So the Hermosa Beach Pier is out here at the end. Um, and there, were, there weren't that many uh, buildings or developments at, in, at that time. Uh, the school, the brick company, a couple brick companies, and then a, um, a Western Fuel Gas and Power Company. You had to have gas and power for development. And this is um, a late, another view of uh, early Hermosa. There was lumber companies um, and brick, the brick companies, a laundry the power, gas and power company in the school. This is all just 1908. All this land's platted, but not much is developed yet. Here's a little comparison of 
what the downtown Hermosa Beach area looked like between 1908 and 1912. So I highlighted in red all the stuff that was there on the Sanborn maps in 1908. Uh, there was a bowling alley, there was a hotel, a post office, grocery, not too much in 1908. And then 1912, there was a, there was a rooming house, a bathhouse. That's kind of where um, the Hermosa Hotel is now. There used to be a bathhouse there, just north of where the Mermaid is. Population didn't take off really too much. I mean, 1910, only 679 people. 1920, 2300, 4800, pretty slow growth. Here's an old postcard view of what uh, the buildings there in 1912. Uh, in 1908. So again, in red, buildings that were there in 1908, the pier would be out here. This is this is um, Santa Fe Ave, later to become Pier Avenue. Here's the, you can see the rail lines here for the electric railway going along Hermosa Avenue, the Pacific Electric Railway now. Nice that they had an ice cream parlor in 1912. So now you, uh, you've seen, you know, kind of how we started out and this is what it looks like now. So now we have the green belt coming down, which was the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe line coming down here to the Redondo Beach Harbor, now King Harbor. And back up where you had the Bayona Creek, which is still flowing down now, it's a, it's a channel, it's a cement channel here. So you had the Bayona Creek area, Marina del Rey, Playa del Rey. Um, you now have the third busiest airport in the world. You've got a SoFi Stadium now out in Inglewood. And you've got a now much improved Hyperion that's actually part of the city of Los Angeles that was annexed and still needs some work to stop the secondary flow of uh, treated water into the bay, but it's not raw sewage going north at, like it did up in, in the 1900s. And then now you have the largest harbor in the USA that was started by Phineas Banning. And this is now Los Angeles, San Pedro over here. Wilmington up in here and Long Beach over here. And that's it. So water enabled harbors for trade, harbors required railroads to move the goods and people. And once you had those in place, then you had real estate sales to create the cities. So I'm done. Any questions? Wow, no, and that, that was fantastic. Thank you, Mark. You added more since last time since we screened the presentation, was it last week? Yes. <laughs> Even from Turkey. Um, so I do already have a question here from Rick, and he said, what happened to Dead Man's Island? <clears throat> well, as the, I don't know the exact year, I can't, but as the harbor grew and the and they decided to put in breakwaters, they, uh, they that island, basically became part of the, I think the rocks on Dead Man Island basically became part of the breakwater. And it was just uh, eliminated from the, from the harbor area. There was another little island out there called Rattlesnake Island. Um, I think that's now basically Terminal Island, which is where they have uh, the Terminal Island jail or prison. Yeah, Rat, Rat Island, I remember hearing that. Um, Let's see. Cheryl asked about the recording. So we are recording it and we did have a lot of people come in after we started. Um, so we will uh, clean up the copy and have it posted on our website. Right. Uh, probably I will put the link to, from our web on our website to our YouTube channel and you can check it out there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes. We'll have to start Mark his own separate playlist of all of his presentation recordings. Oh, thank you. You're very generous. <laughs> Well, I do occasionally. It is Thursday after all. So, um, and does anybody have any other questions? We're going to hang out for just another minute. Um, 
You know, I had a question, but I've already forgotten. Um, oh, how, hi, Tim. Hope you're doing well. How did they market Hermosa Beach and who were they targeting? Pardon? How did they market Hermosa Beach and who were they targeting? Oh, well, if you go back to the early advertisements, um, they called it the aristocrat of beaches. Um, so it was, it was definitely marketed to wealthy people to have um, vacation cottages. So those rail lines could bring people from Los Angeles where they had their big mansions um, down the coast over, you know, on the electric or, or using the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe. And, ba and those rail lines were pretty efficient. You could get down from the city of Los Angeles to Hermosa, Redondo in, in like less than an hour. So it was pretty efficient. And you gotta, and you gotta realize automobiles hadn't really taken off and, and there weren't many streets or boulevards in Los Angeles basin until after the 1920s. So the only way to really get down to the beach areas was gonna be on the railways or, you know, coming overland with a wagon, you know, or, or a horse or, you know, and um, so the rail lines really enabled that, that real estate development because then people could quickly get down to the beach area, have their beach cottage that they would use on the weekend or, or um, you know, stay there for a few weeks in the summer. But it was definitely marketed as, you know, as an aristocratic area. And also Redondo had already been promoting itself as a big tourist destination. So there was a lot of tourism coming down to Redondo. And Hermosa um, was, uh, was a dry city for a while. So they were more uh, temperate than Redondo. Redondo was where everybody went down and kind of had a good time. And the land was sold in Hermosa as being kind of a more temperate area uh, for people. Although I've heard some really great stories about bootleggers in Hermosa that I think we're using for something else later, so I won't reveal the stories. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I, I think it's always been, what is it, the, the phrase that uh, a, a certain Rick I know says, uh, a small drinking town with a surfing problem. Um, yeah. Uh, somebody put in the Q&A, which I forgot to look at, um, is the connection between L.A. and Harbor now a rail line? Yeah, so they, um, I forget the name of it, but there is a, there is a major, major rail connection still between um, the Harbor and downtown L.A. Um, I think you could probably Google it and see it, but yeah, it's, it's most of the freight moving out of the Los Angeles Harbor now is, is still on rail. You know, Phineas Banning's legacy and, the, and it goes up that shoestring to the big rail yards uh, east, of Los east of downtown LA. Okay. And then, so I see, uh, I see a question about El Segundo. Yeah, from my mom, because uh, she's from El Segundo, well, from Hawthorne, but uh, she, an okay. El Segundo kid like you and I. Yeah, so I grew up in El Segundo. My parents built their house in 1948. But I, I ended this uh, presentation um, kind of before El Segundo. I got Hermosa in there and Manhattan in there. I got Manhattan in there and Hermosa in there. But um, so 1911, um, Standard Oil of California, Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, you know, arguably the richest man in the country. Um, he decided that they needed another uh, refinery in Los Angeles. And so they surveyed land for a second refinery, hence the name El Segundo. And um, interestingly, um, they chose the dunes of El Segundo to build that refinery because they could build the refinery above sea level. And at that time, the oil was coming into the uh, standard oil refinery by pipeline. And so the refinery made the refined products and the refined products, oil and kerosene was uh, transported by pipeline, um, gravity fed from the refinery down to a wharf off of El Segundo. So standard oil had their own big wharf that was used for ships to pull up to and 
take refined products away from El Segundo to be sold elsewhere. Uh, we have another question uh, about Abbott Kinney and where he came in. You know, I know Abbott Kinney in, in Venice. Right. That's all I got, though. <laughs> so, you know, I'll flip back up here if I can. Oh, does it let me flip there? A little slow, maybe it's the connection. But anyway, Abbott Kinney... Um, Uh, this isn't a real good map to show it, but this is Venice here. So Venice was was developed by Abbott Kinney as a tourist destination. You had Ocean Park there. You had a pier, the old Lick Pier. Um, and his vision was to create kind of the Venice of America. And he built a bunch of canals and sold property along the canals and had uh, places where people could put up tents and stay in tents in Venice and go to the amusement area and where all the restaurants and amusement park was. Um, and he had, and there were rail lines that were coming down to service uh, the Venice area. Um, mm -hmm. So you have Abbot Kinney Boulevard now there up there in Venice and uh, Again, he, he was plagued by the Hyperion going north, that current. Um, and that really hindered his development uh, of his, that really hindered his vision of, of having this beautiful um, Venice of America. Was there anything more specific about Abbott Kinney or just wanted to know where, how he fit in? I think he fit into the development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What year was Venice founded as a city? Do you remember? Oh, you're going, you're taking me out of the South Bay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's say yeah. late, let's say late 1800s. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Mark. This is actually a giant test. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Um, any last questions? I uh, will give it a couple one more minute. Otherwise, um, I think Jenny put our email address into the chat, but it's just Hermosa Beach Museum at gmail.com uh, or um, come on by our museum in Hermosa uh, at 710 Pier Avenue. We're open Wednesday through Sunday from 2 to, 2 to 4 p.m. And we have uh, a docent training this Saturday. So if any of you guys are sitting at home in Hermosa and you want to get out and come docent with us, um, make sure to show up there. There will be donuts. <laughs> donuts. I'd like, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone that, that uh, showed up to watch it. It's going to be on our website. <laughs> I know there was a lot of information to digest. Um, so flipping through it again might give you, you know, a second look and, and pick up some things that you missed the first time. Um, and then I'm going to work on another one called oil and airplanes, which is going to, basically take in that whole El Segundo development and then how uh, aircraft manufacturing really shaped the economy of the, how oil and airplanes shaped the economy of the South Bay um, leading up to World War II. I'm excited for that one. I think it will be good, but I'm biased. So, um. yeah. <laughs> and uh, but, then, but, then, but you can, you can see besides the, besides the ports and the amusement part of Redondo, there really wasn't a lot of economy going on um, in this slide. So the economy starts uh, later in the in the teens and 20s. Mm. Okay, and then see put, Venice was born on July 4th, 1905. Pardon? Uh, Venice was born on July 4th, 1905. Okay. Okay, so this two years, two years older than Hermosa. Yeah, that would be uh, incorporated, I guess. Okay, and then this is actually a really good question to end on. Uh, Rick, again, thank you for stopping by to say hi earlier today, Rick. Um, Rick wants to know how, where does John Wayne Miller fit into all of this? Oh, well, he lives on Loma. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Don't and, put him on blast now. And, and uh, Bernard Hiss, the, the first mayor of uh, Hermosa lived on Loma. So, you know, John Wayne Miller is a big part of that history. Absolutely. Wow. And his wife is a national that. treasure. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Well, on that note, I guess we will, unless, are we missing Mark, Aaron? Did we forget anything? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Thank well. you all. All right. Thank you. Mark, have a Bye. good day in Turkey. <laughs> all right. I will. I'm in Antalya, <laughs> the, the Turkish Riviera. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, we'll, we'll make sure to share a photo in the newsletter. All right. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night.